Yeah. Uh oh. Can you fill me in? Let's talk about it. So, um, you grew up on a council estate. Where was it? Belial. Belial. What yeah. was that like? Um, it, it was interesting, mate. It was, yeah. Um, just, just running around, really, just being a, a daft kid. But like rugby took me into that, into, okay. into a different, like not circle, but it, a rugby got me my discipline and that. I think. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? From growing up in a, like you say, a Belial council estate, a bit lads on the street and that, um, rugby took me to start getting disciplined and respect and stuff like that. So were you a little bit naughty before you started playing rugby? Um, I wouldn't say like naughty. Just a lad, a, lad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. But just, I was just with lads, just yeah. running about. Just doing, doing what young lads what do. Doing, yeah. yeah. And then, so what, what was what was home like? Did you come from a good home? Yeah, yeah. Good home. Yeah. My dad's still together. Yeah, um, it's rare nowadays, isn't it? My, you know, my mum and dad. Um, it's it's really rare that you you find people whose parents are still together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, growing up, me, me dad was in and out of jail quite a lot. Um, but saying that, me getting into rugby is what really changed him as well. I'd say it's because it got him into the coaching side. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. He was down on the Warriors. I just started playing rugby. He took me down there at a bloke that he worked with. How old are you at this time? Oh, I, mean, I think we're about eight. Oh, wow. Yeah, about eight. And um, a bloke who used to coach at the amateurs, he used to work with me, old man. And um, my dad just mentioned, you know, me wanting to start playing rugby or whatever to him. And he said to him, he says, oh, we'll bring you down, Mick, and, and uh, we'll just see if he enjoys it, see how it goes on. And uh, we took me. We went down, I trained, and all in there. Just and were you a big back. kid, I normal, big average? Kid, yeah, were you? Big kid, yeah, yeah. Always, tall, chubby, tall, what? Yeah. Tall, yeah, tall, big, mate, yeah. <laughs> big cold. Yeah. <laughs> I bet his eyes lit up when you walked in then. Yeah, he did, mate, to be fair. I remember the first session. Um, Dave Corney, what coach, and um, his son used to play, Jake, and uh, I went down for the first session, and he gave me a right? Because obviously, I'd, I'd never played with him before. <laughs> Right, Mick. Here's the ball. He says, "I want you to run." There were like a defensive line in front of me. I want you to run and try and put ball down behind that line. I'm like, All right, okay. Anyway, ran, did it straight away, broke a line, scored. <laughs> I looked at my dad. Come do it again, Mick. See if you can do it again. Did it again. Just one more time. See if you can do that again. <laughs> did it again. And he was like, "Right, okay." He says, uh, "And that was it." It's just like signing your job means. Oh wow. All right. Yeah. And so, how long did you play for them for? Um, I played Fort Warriors for, I think, up till about 15, until about 15 year old. And are they amateur? They're amateur, yeah. So how did that progress? Well, I went from, um, I think I might have been, I, I'm saying that, mate, I think I might have been like, I might have been 12, actually, because I remember going to one to Parkside. Oh, right. Up until 15, and then I went back to the Warriors from my last amateur season at the under 16s. Um, and then all the way through, like from 12 onwards, I would have lead scholarship. Um, and then 16, that's when you sign your. That's when, if you get a deal or not. Um, but at this point, I was like representing my country. I was now playing for Oh, wow. So uh, I was doing alright. Um, and then 16 came. And John Bastian, um, he was at Leeds, he, he, good, good, you know, youth developer. And uh, he was at Warrington at the time. Leeds came to my house asking me to sign. Uh, I, I said, no, I want to go see some clubs that were interested. Who did you support? Um, at the time, I, I did like Leeds because my, my brother in law were there. Right. Um, but. At the same time, I, I, I need to get the best out of rugby, you know, money-wise, my future. Wow. Everything, so... 16-year-old, you're thinking that? Yeah. Well, did that dad have an influence on that, or was that you? Um, a bit of both, but my brother-in-law had a big influence on it, like, because, obviously, he'd, he'd already been through the system. He, yeah. He was, like, he would tell me X, Y, Z, do you know what I mean? And so, I think I had, out of all the teams, mate, in Super League, I had nine that wanted me to go see him and like sign me so I ended up going to Warrington I, I went to Warrington to have a meeting with John Bastian my agent 
um, and basically the they offered me a, a really good deal. Like I think it was something if I were to sign in the forty eight hours, they give me X amount in my bank straight away as a as a um, what do they call it? <laughs> a bribe. Yeah, <laughs> they give me X amount in my bank as a lump sum and then pay me right. whatever for, throughout the three years I were there. Can you remember numbers, roughly? I know that at sixteen mate they offered me if I were to sign in forty eight hours they'd put ten grand in my bank. Wow. Away. And And what other clubs offering something similar? To be honest, mate, Warrington were after Leeds came to my house, Warrington were the next next place I went. Right. And with them saying that, being a sixteen year old kid <laughs> and my agent was sat there and he were like at, the, at this point mate, my agent had like Danny McGuire, my brother in law Jamie Peacock like he had you know um, the top Did you say your brother in law and Jamie Peacock or is Jamie Peacock your no, brother in law? Brother in law and Jamie Peacock. Ah, right. yeah, no. um, so um I spoke to my agent and they were like, Look, you've got forty eight hours if you want to sign with them, you do it. He says, I'll be totally honest with you. He says, the next team that I think would be around, like, wanting to match him is Wigan, because Wigan wanted me, like, a lot of the time. Uh, but they wanted me to move down there, you see, did Wigan, which okay. was a big commitment for a 16-year-old kid. You know, moving in with another two 16-year-old lads, I think it was, at the point, I think it was, Ryan Hampshire from Wakefield. Um, another lad, I can't remember, but they wanted me to move in with with two other lads but do like a little flat share play yeah, a flat yeah. share thing um, which is a big commitment mate the 16 year old and I was still wanting to get a national diploma in sport at school so um, or I thought I got advice to stay in education so um, yeah I, uh, I sat down with my agent had a, had a word with him and just like listen he says I think it is the, uh, the best deal that you're going to get um, there's certain coaches who are still involved with England teams then that would have worried him like I just think it'd be a, a great progression for you through through your career. So long story short, I ended up signing there, didn't it? Yeah. Right. So you lived in Leeds and you just travelled for training. I travelled to training, mate. I um, I got the train with uh, Brooke Braun. Um, meaning we used to get the train there, and then Joe Bastian would bring us home because he's from Leeds. Um, and then as obviously as soon as I passed my test at seventeen, I just started driving then. Got money in bank. Yeah, well, okay. right, <laughs> Uh, that's, they put me through my driving test. I didn't have to pay for no driving lessons. Wow. Um, was that part of the contract? Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have to pay for no lessons at all. So literally, as soon as I passed, I, I had that money there to get a car, to get the insurance. Then I was just going back and forth and with Brooke. Um, and Brooke left, and then one of my best mates signed with me for my last year, Marcus Elliott. We were like really close at the time, you know, going to and from training every day with each other, playing with each other. Um, and then um, I got offered to stay for another two years. And then Marcus left, I think he signed to Bradford. Um, and then I, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm young. So you stayed from 16 to 18? Yeah. When, my, my how old were you when you got your first game? Your first walking out into Warrington's pitch, capacity um, crowd? team that really wanted you yeah they were, they were, they were, they were, they were like Paliasina that were playing Pat Richards um, Greg Burke you know there were some like good big bruises in there and I was 18 and that, that, that was my like first decent game we weren't in really luckily we won anyway yeah what position did you play prop wow yeah. wow so those first few tackles yeah, 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 yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like, give me a long ball, give me a long ball. Uh, did you get targeted? I didn't, mate, no. no. I really, like, you know, we're going like, to just a physical team. Yeah. So, obviously, you had to try and match their physicality. And what, Warrington had a, we had a big side anyway, but obviously, I was baby on pitch, really. Yeah. I know, 18 year old, I was like, baby on pitch, but I, I believe I did all right. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy to see, like, when you see your Jack Walkers and all your young ones coming through the academy and then the first game, you they, they look young. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, next to some like they've got the hair's all nice, they've yeah. got no scars, <laughs> yeah. they look like they've never had a bus yeah. nose before, and you just think, no, don't, don't yeah. hit him, don't do yeah. this. See, I'm the opposite, Neil. Like, I wore, because I play prop my whole life, yeah. so, and I'd boxed since I was like nine, ten. So right. I, I was already like fairly physical, I was a big lad anyway. Yeah. So I, I, I was up there with my sort of match to my physicality, I was always an aggressive player. I mean, I, I, I had like no respect for my body, so I didn't mind getting whacked and, and whacking. Do you know what I mean? So I was always all right. Yeah. So did you go from there to Huddersfield, or was there something in between? Yeah, no, I went from I went from there to Huddersfield. Um, I think I spent two and a half year at Huddersfield. Um, and was that a choice to leave, or did you contract ten? And you weren't sure whether. Contract ten, then I got offered again two year, um, and then that's when I came closer to home. I had a chat with my family and uh, my agent, and said I want to just. So at the moment at the point, um, Chris Thorman and Andy Kelly, and I'd heard a lot of good stuff about them both. Obviously, I knew Chris Thorman just through watching him as a player, um, and Andy Kelly, I'd heard is a what a really good bloke to be under. Right. And I'll be totally honest with you, mate. When I went to Huddersfield, they were by far my best two years that I've ever played rugby. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. They, because of the way they trained you and made you play, or is yeah, was were, it just you? I was happy that their training, how they, how they presented themselves, like they, they stripped me down from, I think I was walking around at one and at like 115 kilo. I went to one and I, I played my best season at 92 kilo. They stripped me down and I was athletic, do you know what I mean? I yeah. was, still playing prop? I'm still playing prop. Prop lose forward because I lost a bit of weight. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that was definitely, they were definitely my the most I've ever enjoyed rugby for the Huddersfield and um, they definitely got the best out of me there Chris Thorman did anyway the smartest coach I think I've ever been with oh wow yeah. so what why Why do you think you made it professionally is it it can't have just been because you was a big sort of 16 year old um, no I wouldn't I wouldn't have said it with that mate I just think I was for my age and I was, I was very physical do you know what I mean I, like I said I didn't mind getting waxed I didn't mind throwing my body at whoever I was throwing it at like and I think, I think that that got a lot of people's attention. Right. I mean, like I played for England, I was prop, and I just I just matched everyone physically. Whoever I came up against, I matched them physically. I, I was aggressive. I, if it sounds a bit like, corny, but if there were any like bother on pitch or up like that, like I was sort of the man. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. To go to, but um, and I think that's what. Obviously, I think that's what every team needs, and I think that's what every coach looks for. Is a bit of a an enforcer type player. They used to say, you know, like yeah. like, it's, it's, like I say, there's any bothery or if, if they've got a prop that's a big aggressive person, like I'd be that man for him. Do you know what I mean? So I think that was a big part to play for me. And with boxing, that got me my confidence through the roof. I always just used to think if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah, I'm yeah. all right. Do you know what I mean? Two completely different things. Like with rugby, the aggression where it was. I suppose in rugby it is sort of controlled as well, isn't it? Yeah, it, a lot but more with, in boxing. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say boxing. It's very, very controlled aggression, yeah. isn't it? It is. A con- like rugby, like you say it's con- it is controlled aggression. Don't get me wrong, but obviously you're not allowed to fight in rugby. You're not supposed to fight in rugby. You're not supposed to fight in rugby, <laughs> but you see a lot of fights break out. Now that's obviously like loss of control, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, um, don't get me wrong. I had my fair few fights in rugby. That's why boxing helped me so much because at rugby at any point it could happen especially for a pro mm. it could happen at any point so b- boxing brought me on as a rugby player loads I remember one time I think I took a, a good few months out of boxing and my rugby definitely changed definitely changed like I think my presence just wasn't as loud I don't think I don't right. know what it was but uh, me personally I didn't notice it um, but it was like people told me like is everything alright what's up like and I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm sweet. Like, <laughs> no, it's wrong. Everything's all right. Um, and it just dawned on me, like, boxing, I've not boxed for so many months. And I went down wow. and boxed. And I remember coming back and, like I say, just my presence were just there again. Do you know what I mean? I was I were there, really. So, you, it was, what, how old were you when you injured yourself? 21? 21, yeah. 21. 20, 20, 20, yeah. And is that, whilst, is that in a game at Huddersfield? No, I was, I was um, weightlifting. Oh really? Yeah, with weightlifting, yeah. Um, our feeder team, what? York, I believe. Yeah, York. 
and well, we're doing strength testing now with obviously the lads at pre season. And uh, I'd gone to press, I, I don't know, I can't remember how much, but I think a bit of a, a three rep max. And uh, so obviously we'll put him weight on, you know what I mean? See, obviously, it's strength. So and was it a control thing with people there, or was it like lads going, oh, let's see how much we can do? No, 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 it was a, a full thing of strength and conditioning over there. Oh, right. Oh, there. okay. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it was a proper thing. Um, and I mean, obviously we had iPads to write scores in and stuff like that, and it was a proper calculated session, it was a proper session that, that's done. And then um, I'm bench pressing, and I've done my first couple of sets, and yeah. Uh, uh, this was the heaviest I've gone on. I can't remember what we're on there, 160 something maybe, something like that. And I pressed once, pressed twice, fine. I've got to do my last rep halfway up. Obviously my, my chest just snaps. So So you're laid on your back. Yeah. You do you hear, do you feel, does it just just something goes? Does the weight drop? Yeah, yeah, but I had three spotters. Right. So I had one either side and obviously a man behind me. But I genuinely didn't feel anything snap. It, it just, just gave way. It just gave, yeah. yeah. But it gave, but it was it a very strange feeling, mate, because they took the bar off me. I don't even think the bar hit my chest. I don't think the bar had time with my chest. You know, because I had them spotters there. Yeah. And it took the weight off me and it's put it on, on the rack. And I physically couldn't get up. And uh, it felt like the bar were on me. Like, it felt like the bar were there oh, across wow. my chest. So I'm like, take the bar. Like, fucking take the bar off me. I'm, I'm lady, I can't move. He's like, nah, I've took the bar, mate. And I went, we'll get your knee off me. Because I thought, because obviously it was a heavy weight, I thought he'd put his knee on. He so you could leap, push up. To leap, like, yeah, oh, off, so he could pull so it up. Yeah, yeah. Up. So he's like, you can get up. I'm like, get up. So anyway, I couldn't, like, physically sit up. So I've rolled off the bench. And uh, I had a tight t-shirt on at the time and people were like, oh, like, look at your chest, you, what's up with your chest? And I looked down and my pec was well, like down in the ribs and there was just nothing here, it all sunk in. Um, Jesus. Uh, at first I was like, something's not right there, is it? So I've it's not even like you can say, oh, I've broke my arm, or it's, no, like, yeah. you wouldn't even have a clue what that was. Uh, no idea, <laughs> no idea. Um, and I took my top off. Like I say, my, my chest was literally down near my pec, down near my ribs. So, I'm like, oh, fucking hell, what have you done there? Like, your chest's gone. Like, look, at, like, they were literally bulging here. And, like, you, you snapped it all. My strength condition, like, you've snapped your chest. Like, there's nothing all attached there. Anyway, I'm like, I sat down. I had to drink water. That's so when I started getting sweaty and I was feeling sick. Next minute, mate, boom. Cold. So you didn't feel any pain or anything? No, not until I woke up. Oh, I woke up okay. They put me in recovery position. I was out for quite a bit. I don't think it was like a, a 20 second out and up. I, I was out for, for quite a bit, mate, a few minutes. So they put me in recovery position. But obviously them just doing it quick. I woke up with a bloke's hand in my mouth. Holding me, holding me like, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> holding, me, holding me tongue down. And uh, I woke up. And they put laid me on the side that I'd snapped. Uh. So they put me like this. And as I woke up, I rolled on my back and I've left my arm out. And the nerves. Oh, mate, I'm sat here like this now. And this. <laughs> <laughs> the, the nerves, everything just started going like mad. My arm started shaking, doing whatever you were doing. I couldn't feel it. My arm was just like literally shaking everywhere. And I, that's when I screamed because I felt the. You know, when I turned over, my arm was still there. I felt the pain. I felt just like a massive rip. Went to the uh, hospital of Pinderfields and went and had a, a five hour reconstruction the day after. Um, the surgeon said he'd been, I think he'd been operating on people for 18 years and he'd only ever seen one like this. And they were like, nothing all attached. Tendon snaps, ligaments snaps, muscles snaps. She pecked me up with three muscles, all three snapped. Tendons and ligaments, I had drills in flattened tendons and a full, a full reconstruction. Wow. So, what, how long did that take to, or what was that recovery like? Because it won't have just been 
rest one day and then eventually it would have been back to normal. I wanted that place, but mentally it challenged me big time because I would have been glad I liked lifting weights, I liked playing rugby, I liked boxing. But for the first, I think it was about 12 week, I had a, I want a sling it what? I had like a, I had a, pad, a bit of padding under here and my arm was literally strapped to my body and they paralysed my right side for, I think they paralysed my right side for like 10 days. So I physically couldn't move my right side. Yeah. Um, and it was strapped to my body. Um, and uh, I think from that I went into a, a sling that I could wrap up myself, do you know what I mean? Start, like, not moving my arm, but if I get a shower, I could take it off. Um, and I was in that sling for about... started doing my rehab but I went from like like that benching whatever I was benching to not being able to lift a five kilo dumbbell off a, off a rack stood still I went I had to go straight into to band work and not even band work straight away just literally movement straight yeah. away with my physio um, my physio very good physio at the time so I would really look I had one I had a physio at Huddersfield and I had a physio at York so I was always covered for you know what I mean, to, to be able to do stuff, so, um, I think I'm in rehab, mate, for about, for about 18 months. So, could you do anything else? Could you train the other side of your body, or did, did you ju- no, just no, proper rest? I, I had to have it completely off for about, I think I had to have about a year, maybe just under a year, completely off, about 10 months off. So, what Huddersfield saying at this time? Are you, st- are you still on their books? Are you still getting paid? Are you... I was seeing the Huddersfield physio. I'm not too sure. Not too sure. Um, I was seeing Doss at the Huddersfield, and I was seeing Ollie at York. But Ollie were also at Huddersfield and York, a bit of a training physio. Um, I think. Um, I'm not too sure, mate, if I was still there or not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, like I say, I could do it for about eight, ten months, nothing at all. And then that's when they said, right, if you go to the gym, go to the gym, strap your arms to your body, start working on your other side. And I'm like, I've just been doing everything you've asked me to, restriction bands. At this point, I want like two and a half kilo dumbbell movement stuff. Um, surely I can start like lifting a bit of weight now. And I'm like, no, you lift a bit of weight, it's going again, you're back to square one. So I had to have any arm strapped to my body, just work, <coughs> just work constantly on my left side or on my legs. So. I wanted that place, mate, but because I would just wanted to give up, I was just like, listen, I'm not going to play again, I'm not going to box again. This is the so thing, if, if if you had any other career, it would just be, well, when it's back, when I can move my arm about again, I can go back to work, I can mm-hmm. go back and do this, but it's literally, it's not just, I mean, it's bad enough having an injury that puts you out anyway, but then to have an injury where you think, is it going to affect the rest of my life in that way? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. it, well, it did. You stopped playing rugby, didn't you? It did, mate, yeah. Like, I was always cautious of... Obviously, I'm I'm in front of lads that are some of them 120 kilo running at you. And if they do a slight step and you overreach, I would, that's what I was always worried about, overreaching and getting, you know what I mean, someone yeah. running through my arm and, and like, tearing again. But um, that's what sort of stirred me to the boxing side. Do you know what I mean? Is as much as that's obviously I need my arm for that yeah I was thinking because I, I didn't know what your injury was yeah, yeah. I knew you'd had an injury but I didn't know what it was yeah. and then when you're telling me I'm sat thinking well, he's boxing yeah, it's not <laughs> he's <sense>. boxing <laughs> the best thing for it um, but I think it's just the fact that there's there's very little impact really on your chest yeah but it's like hooks or yeah, yeah, no. yeah. You know, I don't know mate but I've never felt this since yeah. I've never had a problem with it but yeah, that's what stirred me more towards the boxing side, definitely. So you started boxing. You you didn't box amateur, did you? No. How come? How how I do you two, how do you like, decide that? Like I had two like exhibition fights when I was young. I think I was about twelve. Right. Um, I'd run in Peter Lee and run in Leeds. Um, but I actually went to where I'm fighting out of now, Golden Team, um, to Thai box. 
I was going to say Thai boxing. One of my friends used to do Thai boxing down there. Right, yeah, I went, I went down there to do my Thai. And, um, I like called Steve Lane took me down. That's who I was going to tell you about. Oh, was it? That's yeah? my mate Steve Lane, yeah. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> well, I was speaking to him because, um, uh, I don't know, I think they were good mates with my sister and good mates with my old man, and that was Steve. So um, I, uh, I spoke to him about wanting to do more with my body, you know, like knee, kick, elbow. I said, I'm all right with my hands, like, I, I can box, I can fight with my hands, but I just want to bring more to, to myself, so it's, it took me down to the Golden Team, I did some Muay Thai, and uh, I, I ended up being all right with Muay Thai, they, they wanted me to fight K1, uh, but they were talking to me like going to K1 Pro. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, is there, so, is there anything you can't do? <laughs> you play rugby a couple of times, you professional rugby player, you go kickboxing, you're now... Yeah. <laughs> I really wanted to fight K1 and I really wanted to. Right. I really wanted to fight K1. I did enjoy kicking and elbowing and that, but um, I remember, I think P spoke to Steve saying I want to I wanna take him down K1 roof. Obviously, my tide's a lot of clinch in there. And I yeah. think K1, you get into a clinch, you one strike and you have to let go it's, it's literally more strike you know what I mean you stand there and fight but um, I think it's what to stay about me going down K1 room and they were like just do me a favour Pete before you do it and I was like just watch your box just do some at the gym where it means you just have to box so um, yeah, we ended up going into gym and they were like right we're just going to work on his hands today lads like boxing only today we're just you know we're going to concentrate on some hands so me naturally, I went from a K1 stance straight to my boxing stance, and I, I, we ended up sparring that lot, and I, I did well. So they were like, "Right, nah. <laughs> 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 that's it, you boxing," um, and that's where I went from there. I ended up going. Uh, Mark Bateson, my manager from Moor, um, P got in touch with him and said, oh, "There's a there's a lad here who, you know, what I mean, he's a, he's a good boxer." He's, Never thought amateur, but like, I think it'd, it'd, it'd do all right. Um, Mark went, obviously, I don't, I've never seen it. It was not going amateur. I've just got no background, but I'll have a look at him. And uh, Mark took me over to, for me, one of the most, not intimidating gym, but like, well, for instance, I walked into a gym in Manchester called Collier St. Boston. Great gym, Pat Paris gym. Great people. Great, it is a fantastic gym. And, but the first time I, I was waiting for the butt. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I didn't know they were back in then because my mind obviously was setting rugby. And I uh, walked into gym. It's Pat Barrett and stood here. Like this big gold necklace on, uh, gold teeth, and there's a pit bull just, <laughs> just roaming around the gym. It's a big pit bull on. I'm sure that had like a big gold collar on. And I'm thinking, man, he's not here. <laughs> I'm not leaving here, either alive or, or on a stretcher, so it's not going right here. So, um, anyway, I ended up sparring with uh, Lyndon Arthur, um, a light heavyweight one. Well, he still is, he's a very good light heavyweight, competing at a good level. I think he's Commonwealth champion now. Um, and that was my first ever live spar boxing against someone who's, who's fought in the Olympics. He's, you know what I mean? He's, he's on his way up. Um, the first time sparring. Uh, professional so I ended up sparring with him and um, all the lads at Collier ended up like Pat Barrett like, ended up calling me a ringer don't even know what a ringer is but yeah yeah so um, oh well do you want to explain well, in case yeah yeah basically a ringer is you've not like told the truth about yourself basically yeah. do you know what I mean that you're saying I've never done any of this never done any of that but in background you've done have you seen the Johnny Knoxville film I haven't no. he's done a film called Ringer where he tries to enter the um Paralympics, thinking he'll be able to win a, a medal, um, and you, if you watch it, I, I mean, it was years ago when I watched it, and I was probably on loads of drugs and laughed my head off at it all the way through. So I don't know if it is still funny, right, okay. um, well, but, but, but yeah, yeah, the ringer. Yeah. So go on, sorry. But yeah, no, they, they ended up calling me a ringer because I'd sparred really well. Do you know what I mean? They thought I'd, they, they didn't think I'd never fought before or done anything in boxing. So um, yeah, from there, Mark said to me. Yeah, I'll sign with me basically. I'll three years sign with me. We'll, we'll see how we go, and that's it from there, mate. It's been good for ever since. Wow, mm -hmm. jeez. 
I mean, it's not. Um, it's not. You've been lucky. Obviously, there's something in you where, when it's something competitive or something physical, you just go into a different sort of level. Because you can't. You can't be professionally successful in multiple sports without having something inside you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like some people focus the whole life on one particular thing and then they become that good at it. It makes them a living. But you're just bouncing between boxing when you're little and then rugby and then... I don't know. Do you, how do you think it would have gone in K1? I don't know. I don't you're too pretty it. for stuff like that though. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Sometimes to even I did it today. I walked past the bag and I, I kicked it. Like, <laughs> I just do it. Just, like, I just enjoy doing it, mate. So do you still do the training, or is that bad no, for your boxing? I don't. I just don't. I just don't do it, mate. Right. Uh, not need to. Really. So where was your first professional fight? Ellen Road. Ellen Road. Ellen Road. I fought a lad from. Um, I think he was called Demetrius. I don't. I, I know he had camouflage shorts on. He was called Rambo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so is it different walking out with a team? Into a rugby stadium, singing and chanting songs, and then walking out on your own into a into a boxing event. Um, it's different, mate. But when you're walking, walking out to walking out to a ring and walking out onto a pitch. To be fair, it's it's not far off the same feeling. Do you know what I mean? Because they're watching you. People are. Like all eyes are on you, basically. I know you've got a team with rugby, yeah. but um, it's it's not far off the same the same feeling. Boxing, I'd say, is slightly better. Do you know what I mean? Better. It literally is you. Do you know what I mean? That like, people are watching yeah. you, they're, they're shouting whatever your name. Do you know what I mean? Um, but and have you always had a good following? I've always had a good following. Mate. Yeah. I've always had great sponsors. I've always had you know great people around me, best friends family um, always had good people around me there, yeah. and what music do you come out to um, I actually come out to one of my one of my good mates funeral songs oh wow yeah, ok yeah. Um, I didn't to start with obviously but he was still here with us um, it's called Chris and um, <coughs> I used to I come out to a few different songs but um, he used to obviously he was there at every fight with Chris and for some reason, not mate. Whenever I stepped out of the ring, it was always, always. I say, it, I say it. Is it were always the first person that were ever there. Like when I stepped yeah, out of yeah. the ring and went walk downstairs, you were always there. Like give me a love. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so. So when when you're walking out and that song's playing, are you already in the zone back, and you don't really hear it, or is it? Does it get you fired up, or? I have I have his. I have his photo on my kit. Right. Um, his name on my kit. Um, and even before the song comes on and I'm putting kit on, like, I have him on my chest. I have a, a photo of him on my chest. And I'm always, like, literally saying, come on, yeah, yeah. on it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, but the first time I walked out to his song, like, I was facing the crowd. And uh, I was facing the crowd, mate, and his song come on. Goosebumps everywhere. I turned around and I just started crying. Um, and I was like, obviously, I, I just, I don't know why, I just faced away from, from where I'm from. Yeah, the yeah. Do you know what I mean? I just faced away and like, I'm crying, I'm, I'm bouncing on the spot. I've got goosebumps. Everyone on. behind you will have been thinking, look at this show off know, with his yeah. back to us, jumping about. <laughs> Who does he so think this, he is? At this point, <laughs> I didn't even notice this right until now, but at this point, I've turned my back, but the, that was the first time I'd fought since he passed. And I had this photo right big on my back at this point. Ah, oh, right. All his family were down, like, where, you know, where you walk in these bars there? Yeah. They're all there shouting, and some of them are crying with phones out, and, you know, everyone videoing them. I turned around and started crying, the coach is looking at me, and he's, like, filling up watching me crying, and I'm just like, oh, fucking, this is getting it. <laughs> 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 um, um, so his song has a bit. And, I walked him in there and I think I just did the kid in like two minutes or something like I walked Was this was this like your, is it for because I've, I've looked up and it, I've only been able to find three of your fights and I think it's the fourth the fifth and the sixth and the fourth is a first round knockout or a stoppage yeah um, but 
one one thing I picked up on watching you fight is the commentators. I mean, first of all, they love the fact that you came from rugby. Yeah. They're always, I, know, was, I don't know if any of you know, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, you said this know, two fights ago well. and the last fight. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they all spoke about potential. They all spoke about um, how you've not done amateur fights, how you've just sort of turned up in this form and you're unstoppable. Um, and it's sort of, they're, they're talking fight four, five and six. I'm sure it's them three. Um, and then another five fights later you're still you're still yeah. unbeaten ten fights unbeaten yeah they do speak out of me to be fair yeah uh, but like I said like a lot to do with it mate is the fact that I've got such a good following because like people might think I just say it to say it but without them people buying tickets and stuff like that, I wouldn't be able to get in that ring yeah do you know what I mean they, I've got to have a good following to step in that ring if I don't have a good following people aren't buying tickets I won't be able to pay for X, Y, Z my opponent and whatever so I won't be able to fight and that's a lot of drive for me like as much as I want to get there personally and for my family like they're putting money yeah. into me yeah, you know yeah. I mean? and I, I don't really think about the fight too much I just think I want them to come back when I fight again do you know what I mean I still want a good following when I fight again like so I don't want to let them down on okay. on their putting their hard working money into coming to watch me fight I yeah. don't want to let them down I want to perform well for them. So would you rather knock someone out in the first round or put on a good fight for a few? Um, I think if it, if I think if you're following someone, if I came to watch you and you knocked them out in first first couple of minutes, I'd be like, I'd definitely pay to see this again. Well, to be fair, mate, I, I think the last kid I fought, yeah, well, the last kid I fought, I knocked him out in the fourth, and everyone was saying that was the best fight, like because yeah, like, yeah, like, we've done three rounds already and they come and fought, and I, I put him away. Uh, wow. So I get to the point of if I'm not going to be like Tyson fight. never lost his fan base. It no. became hard for him to get fights eventually. Yeah. But he never lost his fan base. Yeah, no, no. So. It does have a, a big part to play with them people around you and that. And you, yeah. you want to make them happy. You want to. You know I mean? You want to. You want to make them happy. They come. Yeah, you, yeah. Know, you want them to have a buzz out of it just as much as you do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I say, I can't get nervous about them, so they're in there, they're in it with me. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I have to have them to fight. And do you get nervous? No, and I think this I'm not gonna say no. Every boxer gets nervous. It's a door if you the say in the door the line. Yeah. Um, but I think I get I think I get more obviously I get nervous. I know I'm nervous when I'm going for a <laughs> um, but I, th I get more like I say more excited so I've, I've just done a 10 week hard camp dieting running sparring training strength and conditioning I've just done 10 weeks of hard stuff like, yeah. for this night so I'm more excited and more excited that I can eat shit that night <laughs> um and like I say, I'm just more of just want to perform for people. If I have okay. trained as hard as I can in ten week, if I've trained as hard as I can, I've got nothing to be worried about that night. That's yeah. how I look at it. Do you know what I mean? If I've trained with no stone on terms, whatever happens in that ring, like I've got no worries about it. And does it matter who's in the crowd? No, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Mike Tyson does a podcast um called um Hot Boxing. Okay. So hot boxing's usually when Lord, you just sit in like a really small room and smoke weed and is that with um, did he do it? He, he's done quite a few so he, UFC bloke I think he does it with right big kid with like slick black, black yeah hair. yeah so there's yeah. them two and then they so they interviewed Eminem um, yes. which was really weird and Mike Tyson was talking about being scared before every fight he was scared and he had a trainer that taught him how to switch on this aggression. So it didn't matter who that person was. He had this job to do and he got in the mindset of, I'm going to stop this person, whatever it takes. But he never taught him how to switch it off. Right. And he, blame's not the right word, but he says that a lot, of, a lot of that ability to switch it on and not back off again was a lot of the problems in his personal life. Yeah. And it was just like, you don't, you don't associate fear with Tyson. No, and but you know why I think he was he was scared back in them days anyway and the person he was as an individual like I think the reason for him being scared is 
without boxing for him, uh, yeah, nothing it was. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was nothing. So for him, it probably been scared to get beat because it's the it, reputation it's, it's, and the it's Mike Tyson. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If if he gets beat, it, it's not like without boxing for him, there's nothing. Yeah. So I think that worries mindset. Do you know what I mean? If, if I get beat tonight. I think yeah, that's yeah. about what is for you. So where, where's your head at with that? Like, what what do you want to achieve? Have you set goals? Have you got targets? I just, I always say me, like, I don't look at, now I look at, like, titles and stuff. Titles would be nice, but for me, I, I just want to be able to provide for my family. I just want to look after my mum, my sisters. That's, that's my goal. Yeah. You know I mean, if titles come with it then they come with it but for me no, I just, I'm just doing this because I want to be able to give a good life to them right That's my so mentality. you're what you're 25 now have you have you thought about how long this will last and no um, I am if I'm honest yeah um, just enjoying it while it's happening enjoying it while it's yeah. happening yeah while I'm young I can enjoy yeah. it um, I don't know before you were talking about having to stretch when you get out of bed and stuff I hope none of your opponents <laughs> watch any of this <laughs> Sat here and I'm 36 and we're having a conversation like with 50 year old men. <laughs> it's awful, but I've always done impact sports. So I, I did a bit of boxing when I was young. I played for East Leeds. I used to play, um, I don't think Danny Maguire was on our team, but he did play for that team. Uh, Richie Mathers, right. we played on the same team as Richie Mathers. Then I went to football, uh, got trial for Leeds United, and I jumped off a motorbike when I was 18. Um, showing off oh, right. we, I was on my way to a kickabout with just some of my friends um, and lads from Beast and used to play against lads from Morley so 11 of them had come down just go to a pitch have a kickabout and I was late so I'm on the back of a bike and I said to the guy who was riding the bike just go into the middle of the pitch and the idea is when we get there I'll jump off the back and be like ta-da yeah, yeah, yeah. and the bike were going too fast and I landed my studs stuck in and my knee twisted and they said I'll never compete again so I could probably have a kickabout if I have a kid in a garden, but I'll never be able to go 50-50 in a challenge because it'll just go every time. So a few years pass, and that's what kept me away from drugs, from crime, from everything. And then when that all stopped, that's when my life just flipped at 20. Because um, uh, the, the one thing that was keeping me straight What's was that? taken away. And this is what I was saying about when you have an injury, that changes everything. It changes your whole mindset. And I was the same as you, you know, what's the point? And you go back to a normal job and you just think, it's not yeah. it's not something I want to be doing um, so yeah so a few years pass and I feel all right and then someone says do you want to play five a side so I'm like yeah I'm sure it'll be fine and then it goes again and I've literally had it rebuilt four times the first what, uh, yeah complete ACL so the the cruciate ligament was that badly damaged it couldn't be repaired so they had to sort of drill through my knee and then yeah, thread yeah. ligament uh, tendons and stuff right. through um, so yeah so Two more times I tried to play football, two more times it went. So I had it rebuilt three times and then the fourth time it was wear and tear. So the hole that they drilled has just expanded more. Right. So they had to do another operation to to fix that. Yeah, and I, uh, I was very lucky when I did my knee. Oh, have I, you done your knee as yeah, well? I've done my knee as well, yeah. How did you do that? Playing, rugby. Oh, right. Was it ACL? No, I did my medial and lateral ligament. Right. I took cartilage away from the cruise ship, but my cruise ship were fine. I didn't, didn't do anything to that. So I only had a brace for about, for about four months. And then I was in a straight leg leg brace for four months and then I think I went to, you know, just a full knee. Yeah, yeah. Um, for the last two. Right. Yeah. yeah, four times. And every time I was just like, I'm never going to do it again. I'm never going to do it again. But then it's it's like I've always said, I stopped taking drugs nearly seven years ago. And the problem is you get to a point in your life where you forget about how bad it was you forget about the consequences you forget about all these things and it becomes attractive again and it was the same with my knee after a couple of years you forget how much you lost you forget about all the the recovery time and all that sort of stuff and you think yeah i'll be able to have a kick about yeah, and it'll be all right time, it's a long time isn't it yeah four times you've gone through your knee con yeah because that i didn't listen the first time of them yeah. saying you can't play football again that's probably two years worth of rehab that you've done yeah. three, four times. So yeah, I mean, it is. So, like, at the point, it doesn't really seem like that. Oh, I'll be out for a few months. Yeah. Right. But you've done it four times. Two years laid up. That's, that's two yeah. years, yeah. Yeah. It's a 
long time. But yeah, when I was younger, we used to do inline skating, you know, like sliding down rails and right, yeah, yeah, gapping yeah. steps. So yeah. all the pads in my knees are all worn away anyway. So you've got the little things that like the absorbers in between your bones. Right. Um, so now when I walk up steps, it just like it like clicks, yeah, yeah, it's, clicks it's as I go up. <laughs> it's definitely my knees. <laughs> yeah, bloody hell. Yeah, I do. I'm I'm feeling old. I'm feeling old. I can't. You see, my problem is I get carried away. So you're on about putting your body on the line in a sporting way. I I went snowboarding and I went on a snowboarding holiday um, in 2013. I didn't know how to snowboard, so I went to Xscape. And on my last lesson at Xscape before we went, a few days before we went, I cracked three ribs, but then traveled 24 hours on coaches and trains, got to teens, managed to snowboard for 10 days, but on the fourth or fifth day, I fell and broke my shoulder, but because I didn't have holiday insurance, we just finished the holiday. So I just sort of like pushed myself up with yeah, one yeah, arm yeah. and then got back and then I had to go and get it sorted in NHS. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I did it at Xscape. I went to Xscape. <laughs> Paid to go into escape with my sister's husband, um, and we went to learn to jump and grind on um, snowboards, right. just so I'd have like a, yeah, a like receipt a, to yeah, say, yeah, "Oh, yeah, I've been." Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. And then went, but yeah, I'm, I'm just just daft. Like I, I forget that I'm not 25 anymore, and I think that I can still do all these. 25 in your mind. <laughs> yeah, I'll be remembering that next time I'm laid up. Going, do you know what? Mick, <laughs> he told me. <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned your routine a little bit. So you you said ten weeks before a fight. So if when you when you get to so your your promoter books a fight. He, does he tell you who he is, how he fights, and then you train as a way to beat them, or do you just have your way of fighting? Okay. If I get told the name, I don't like to. No. Right. Like, for me, I. Because I'm self poor anyway. Yeah. How they're going to fight me is going to be totally different to how any of the videos are. So yeah. I don't like to know because... Oh, uh, yeah, I suppose that makes sense. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If, I'll probably... If you if you know the name of someone that you're going to fight, you're going to have a look. Yeah, so, so do you check how many fights they've had and wins and losses? The, the names of... When I found out the names of the people I'm fighting, that's when I'll, 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 I'll have a look. I'll, I don't know, I'll have a look on Box Rec or YouTube. And then I just think, if I, like I said before, if I train as hard as I can, I, I trust my manager, Mark, or Mark, and my coach, Pete, and Daryl, to train me, my strength and conditioner, Reese, to train me according to how they want me to fight that night. So I have to trust them, and I do trust them enough not to want to know who my opponent is. Yeah. I'll just get in there and deal with it that night. So what do those 10 weeks look like? Do you, do you move away for 10 weeks? Me. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Do you get to sleep at home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yeah. So is it just sort of so many hours a day, yeah. complete training? What about food? Well that's, well, that's the thing. Like, like people say, how many hours a day do you train? But like, it is twenty four seven. Like, yeah, because you can't. Is not yeah. Twenty four seven. I might. The lifestyle's twenty four seven for ten weeks. Yeah, literally. You know what I mean? I'm, it gets to a point mate, sometimes when I'm making weight or whatever or I do some sometimes I'll do intermittent fasting so I'll, I'll eat at 12 noon so my hours of eating will be from 12 noon to 7 at night so I've got 7 hours to eat and, and is it is it not like eat as much as you want in that time no, 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 no. so it's set, got set portions stuff, and, yeah, yeah. right uh, like, not, not <laughs> big, like, big, like, when I've had when I've had a main meal Want need so much, yeah, same. Give me some yeah, like, <laughs> um, like a fiend, mate. Just give me <laughs> um, but I've got to drink so much water, I've got to eat so much, and it gets to a point that sometimes we're on a night, I'll be out running at midnight, one in the morning, because when I can't sleep, especially if I've been far and I can't sleep that night, and I know I can't eat late, so I think if I'm sat in the house downstairs doing some. The fridge there. I'm gonna, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I empty when I'm going to camp. I empty all the shit out. I yeah. empty my fridge, my cupboards, everything. Um, and I just put my meals in there. But what about your missus? Huh? Do you live with her? Yeah. What does she do? She's not. So she has she's to do this with, with you. Yeah, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> she's up for no this. way. Um, but and that is hard to be fair. Like when if she if she just come home with a bit of shit or something, I'm like, 
I just want some ice cream. But it gets to the point where where obviously I get an hour can't eat and I'm not tired and I can't sleep, so I'll get my stuff on and I'll go out for a run. Like I have running sometimes at twelve one in the morning and then I'll go home, get in shower, go to bed, just so I don't eat and I put myself to sleep. It gets that obsessive or I get that obsessive with it. I get obsessed with my my, my weight, my physique, my, like how sharp I am. I'd literally get obsessed with it all. A bit too much really. But is it too much because if you were if you were racing a motorbike you'd want to make sure that every bit of that bike was as in tune as it could yeah, be. Of course. Yeah, yeah, you would, yeah. And my body's that motorbike in it. That's that's exactly it. And when when you stop worrying about those sort of things, I think you'll see a de- I mean when you stopped boxing when you were playing rugby you lost that sharpness yeah, yeah, yeah. and it wasn't even something you noticed people were telling you and then you've put it as oh it's because I've stopped boxing yeah. so it's I don't know it's worrying like people think of it as like a, a negative thing like if if you were if you were just a pretty boy who wanted to look good when you went out I think that's yeah. different but this is this is your income you know yeah. the way the way that you fight the way that I suppose, in a sense, the way that you look, um, it is. It's all part yeah, of. It's yeah. all part of your job, isn't it? Yeah. But I wear a, a heart rate monitor for every session, and also we monitor every session. We I have to fill out a grid on the morning to say how I slept, how I feel. Oh wow! I wouldn't have thought any of that. Yeah, yeah, it gets deep. Yeah. Um, I track obviously every session. I do. I have to wear a heart rate monitor, and I send it to the strength and conditioner at Elite Step with this. You sound like that foreign guy off is it kickboxer the the move van damme film is That's like it. he's like a machine and i'm sure they've got computers plugged into him and stuff oh, right, okay. that's what that well, that's, that's what that sounds like. like and i send them all to him and sometimes i'll i'll do strength and con with him on a morning eight o'clock in the morning i'll go do strength and con with him and he could be like you're a bit flat like like what what, what did you do yesterday like and he'll, he'll pull up my graph that you know for my heart rate monitor and he'll be like no. Yeah, and he'll text my trainer because I'll, I'll do my strength and con and then I'll go box. So I'll, I'll do my strength and con. I'll, I'll have an hour break breakfast or two hour break, have the breakfast and then go box. And he'll text my, my coach boxing and say, Mix, flat here, he's feeling it here, he's heavy in his legs. Like, you know, d- d- do his session Jeez. according to how he is phys- like physically. And it's always obviously towards the end of week that I'm. A bit. So do you get days off? Uh, yeah, you get, you get one day off a week. Right. Yeah. Day off as in you've still got to eat right, but you just don't have to yeah, train. Don't have to train yeah. Right. Yeah, you've still got to be fine on the diet. And do you are you allowed to do rude stuff with your missus in those ten weeks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that usually when you have the flat bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, uh, <laughs> so obviously the old myth is don't have sex before you fight. Yeah. But today's ever like it's proven that say if you have sex or this whatever, is what you tell her you don't need to lie to no, me no, I'm not. this is you tell her this <laughs> <laughs> twice a day for 10 weeks research testosterone boosts it higher right you know okay I mean? so but saying that i'm still like before a fight i won't do anything like two or three weeks before right absolutely zero jamming you know I so um, but they say it's, it's still you're not meant to like you're just meant to go on as you would because like you say testosterone gets reset all the time and it's it's boosting so um, so how how's the 10 weeks panned out is it does it start easy and get harder or does it start rough because you've not been because you train all year anyway it's not like you don't train and then you just train for 10 yeah, weeks no, before a fight but like that, but yeah it just gets intense for 10 weeks and is it is it always worse when you first start um no, not really, mate, because the, you've got 10 week, you've got yeah. 10 weeks where you've got three sessions a day for 10 week, so they don't, they don't want to kill you straight away, so you come to the middle of... <laughs> they do want to kill you, yeah, just yeah, not straight yeah, away. Yeah, so, <laughs> like, you come to the middle of camp, and, do you know what I mean, if, if they smash it a bit, and not just that, but they don't want you to peak too early, do you know what yeah. I mean, they want me to come down, go up, come down, and shoot up for a fight, so... They never want you to peak to they, They've got it all set up, mate. To be fair, I'm, I don't have to obviously look at any of that. Then. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's what they do. Um, 
So what about 24 hours before a fight? How different is that? What's your routine? Um, 24 hours before a fight. I'm just normal, mate. Like on fight night, people, some people like before they see me, you know, go down to the venue or whatever. Though, like they say, I you don't. Why are you so like calm? Fighting, you yeah. Know, like, but I'm just like, that's me as a person. I'm I'm very laid back. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think I've ever. I've never like lost me. I don't. I'm a very laid back person. Do you know what I mean? Um, but 24 hours before a fight, mate. It's obviously still eating healthy. And, Drinking a lot of, or saying that to be fair, 24 hours before the fight, it depended if you weigh in before or on the day of the fight, which I have done. I've weighed in on the day of my fight. I've like had to, so like, let's say the week to my fight. I'm fighting on Friday, is Monday. I'm having to up my water from 6 litres a day to 8 litres a day, which is that in itself is training. That's hard to do, is drink up 6 litres anyway, it's hard to do. Yeah. So, so I have to open from like six litres to eight litres a day and then like two days before so say the Thursday I don't drink like very little I drink maybe not even a litre is that purposely to dehydrate yourself at weighing? yeah yeah to, right. to, to make weight okay. um, and then on the day obviously you weigh in after weighing mate it's, it's a big for me I always go like big chicken carbonara I mean, oh, yeah. and, pasta. Um, and even then I'm still wanting some shit after my cards and I've got to <laughs> got to fight it soon um, but I tend not to eat that morning me I tend not to eat like I, I can if I want because I oh, always make my way yeah. and I could put like a, l- a little bit of something down my neck first thing in the morning but I just I just tend not to I don't know why I just tend so not if you're to fighting at 5 o'clock you'll eat sort of midday 1 o'clock yeah yeah yeah, yeah right. about that time. I literally might, might have one like I said make like a Yeah. From Italian or and then how soon after your fight is oh, junk food and cake? And <laughs> 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 I've, had, I've had some of the days before, like, do you want me to bring this? I love the cake or you know, <laughs> the, uh, caramel shorts. Do you want me to bring this in, in for you for after fight? And I'm like, if you're going to, please don't put it there before. <laughs> bring it in after do you want a pizza do you want to order some dominoes after after fight but then I still need to think like I'm always towards the end of the fight sometimes there's a lad or two fighting after me yeah they don't want to be warming up watching me eat pizza yeah do you yeah. know what I mean they don't so out of respect I'm always like no no leave it but then inside you're like I'll meet you in car park yeah, <laughs> but, no, but when everyone's eating I'll when everyone's fought sorry I'll uh, I'll get in car I'll go show my face to everyone in town, you know, that's come to watch me, I'll go yeah. meet them out. But eventually I'll backdoor it, I'll go get a big barbecue pizza, I'll, I'll get a milkshake, I'll get a millionaire shortbread, white chocolate, and I just sit all Do you know what, this is the happiest you've looked through this whole interview, yeah. look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I do, mate, yeah. And then, and then the next morning after my fight, I'll get up, it'll be full English, full mashings, black pudding, bacon, leave the farm. Yeah. Like sausages, um, I'll have some shit in the afternoon and I'll order a Chinese at night. But then I get into a coma, I'm like, oh, and you can go running. I'm, I'm looking in the mirror, my body's changed in 48 hours. I need to go. But um, no, the, the food after the fight is definitely worth that time. Part of the reward. Yeah. 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 Jeez. If I lost though, I've never always had. Touch wood. I haven't been beaten. Well, do we want to talk about this? No, but I'm saying if, if I was to lose, I don't know if I would go on to eat shit that night. Well, all right. Mm. I didn't thought about that before, but I, I wonder if. So, in what, in what sense, like, you don't deserve yeah, like don't deserve I've it? I've done something wrong. Yeah, I, don't know. I bet it's worse because you've never had an amateur fight, because you've never lost a fight. Like that first loss. It, 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 you, I mean, it's Jade gonna, it's gonna be tough. Who did? Jade. <laughs> 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 yeah. So you'll go back to that being that ten-year-old getting beaten up. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but no, it is. So I, I mean, I can't compare my life to yours. Um, but you came to the. We'll get on to determined Dan as well. You came to the meal at Headingley, um, and I do spoken word. And the reason I was asking about, does it matter who's there and do you get nervous? Because I went through a phase where 
if certain people were in the room, I'd get up on stage and forget my words. And it's like I was too busy trying to impress. And it were people who I looked up to when I first started. Um, so I'd only been doing it for sort of three years. And then I went through a phase of the same where I, I was at um, quite an iconic venue in Leeds, uh, Leeds Playhouse, West Yorkshire Playhouse. And backstage, there were people who'd been doing it for years and they were rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing. And I was just sort of like, I was thinking maybe I should be more nervous because of how other people are acting. Right. Um, and then I've forgot my words before and it's awful but that one at Headingley because like I, I so the poem about cancer mentions Dan and my mum and my auntie and then one of my friend's mums who passed away and it's never been an issue performing it but when those people are in the room right. and it's an event for them and I don't like where you were sat you were sat on the same side as where my mum and everybody yeah. were um, and I just I couldn't look that way and I just, I needed to be facing the other side because that's why, and the song that you was on about where you walk out to it, that's how I felt. Like I was, I could feel myself getting upset just because they were there, you know, yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah. it's... But for me, you doing that, mate, like... Did you cry? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I just got a title. Like, <laughs> yeah, I did feel like, uh, but um, for me, mate, you doing that, me doing what you do is probably just as scary as for you doing what I do. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? For us yeah, to switch yeah. roles, mate, I'd shit my... I, honestly, mate, I would shit my fans getting up. You'd definitely have one loss if I went in place of you. <laughs> I'm telling you now. <laughs> <laughs> At least you won't be there for it. <laughs> yeah, true, true. But no, mate, I, I, I would. I'd, I, I wouldn't be able to do what you do. Like, yeah. Getting up and speaking is a, a big thing for me. Anyway. It's tough. I'm all right with stuff like this. Yeah. It's, it's just us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're sound, but... For me, get up and speak to, and yeah. it's like you do. I, but I do, I do the spoken word bit, but I try. I don't plan um, like I do talks, and I don't plan what I'm going to say. And sometimes it catches me out. So I was at a police crime commissioner's event, and there's 500 people in a room, and I get up on stage. It's my profile picture on Facebook, so I'm stood, and then it's got my my name in massive letters on the wall in the background. It's projected on, um, and I got up and. I had corona, well, my GP thinks I had coronavirus at the wow. start of March. So I'm sort of shivering and like my nose is running and I'm sort of telling people, like, oh, we didn't know what it was then. Coronavirus right. wasn't a thing then. We didn't find out for two weeks that this was a thing. So I've got up on stage and I'm literally stood saying, um, you know, thank you to Ian from St. Giles. He's come on board and I'm not very professional the way I am and da da da. And this is an event where there's people who I could potentially be working with, like funders and stuff right, in the okay, future. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just, they're going, yeah, I'm just. <laughs> just <laughs> no, and I, I, I hate it. So a lot of the stuff we do, people ask you for blurb about who you are, what you do. Right. Absolutely hate it. When people come up and say, oh, that was really good. I feel so uncomfortable. Like I've got, I've just got a stock response of, oh, I really appreciate that. And then change the subject as right, quick okay. as I can. Yeah, yeah. It just makes me feel really uncomfortable. And I don't know why it's not, it's just people showing appreciation for something you do. Imagine people coming up to you after the fact and going, oh, mate, you did really well. And then you've been like, oh, I don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to enjoy that moment. I just, yeah, I, yeah, I dodge it. Dodge it straight away. It's crazy. Yeah, it does, it, that does sound yeah. crazy to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Because you put a lot of time and effort into it. I mean, it's nothing like, again, it's nothing like what you do, but you, you, you create something and then you put it out there. And if you're not bothered about how people receive it, why are you putting it out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you should want people to come and say nice things because yeah. you put time and effort into it. But, but yeah, I'm off. I'm, I'm gone. Yeah, I Cheers, I appreciate it. It's not worse than them lads coming up asking about you should have done this. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah what, what about people who shout while you're doing it? Like some of the videos, it's like, hey, Tim, you're like, yeah. <laughs> cheers, mate. I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that one. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah, you know weird, mate? You never, I don't hear. Right. It's like you get selective hearing when you get in room because I literally hear my, my corner men's voice and ref's voice. That's it. Right. It's, it's weird, mate. And the so squeals when that's... you're paggering somebody. Yeah. I'm squealing. Yeah, it's nice when you see <laughs> what did it feel like the first time you knocked someone out? Um, Not in like a sadistic way. I don't want you to be like, it, yeah. I think, no, I mean, I, I've never been one to like 
say like glow over the top that's one thing I noticed you you touch gloves after most rounds as well which usually it's at the start of a fight but you're quite respectful in that sense oh. where it's, it's end of day boxing's a business in it he needs me and I yeah. need him to, to live to get to where we want to be provide for your family whatever we need each other so it's me and him fighting in that ring he probably looks at the same as me it's not I don't look at boxing as a fight. Do you know what I mean? I don't think I'm going to have a fight tonight. Although I am. It's, it's just not how I look at it. Okay. So do you see it more as like an art, yeah. a game of chess, yeah, yeah, yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah. So I always have that level of respect for them just because as much as I am, they're putting their body online. They're, they're only trying to, to make a living out of it. Yeah. You know I mean, they're doing the same as me. Um, so... And like you say, with like the first person I've tied, I'd, I'd never, ever, ever go over anybody because like, that could be, that could be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And I wouldn't like anyone to go over me yeah, while I'm yeah. on the floor, so um, you've got to have that level of So how does it feel when you win? Because you must have like a bit of a... It's, it is nice when you stop them because yeah. I remember the first time I knocked someone out and like the ref waved it off, kid run on the floor and I remember going over to like where me mate's brother Warren um, his mum and what have you and like, like screaming you know at the top of my voice and I, I, I think I tend to write hard and scream somewhat I don't know what I scream <laughs> um, ever since that whenever I've stopped anyone since I think because in the moment that was the first fight it wasn't there and stuff like that do you know what I mean a little bit come over me and I stopped the kid and I like, like yeah. do you know what I mean got a bit carried away but since then whenever I've stopped anyone I've just yeah. Step back in my corner. That'd be That's it. Door. Finished. Game over. Yeah. Job done. Yeah. Um, and after, do you know what I mean? I have obviously more respect for him after fights. You've got to. You can't over respect him in there. You over respect him in there, and then you might slip up somewhere and get caught. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You've got to have a bit of dog in you. Um, so, but after the fight, there's nothing but. I, I respect any person that jumps in ring. Love and respect to any person that jumps yeah. in ring. So. Yeah. I'm guessing everyone you fought has had. A lot more experience, a lot yeah, more yeah. fights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm still in learning fights. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, if obviously you, you call them journeymen, so I've got a lot of learning fights. I've I've had some learning fights, and I'm I'm still getting they're getting a lot more competitive now, but they're still learning fights. Do you know what I mean? They're, instead of me stopping them in first, I'm stopping them in fourth. Like yeah. the, the learning fights. Some some of them have fought Tony Bell, you Derek Chisora, Dillian White. Do you know what I mean? They fought David A. They fought good people. So, yeah, the body's there for me to to learn, to work off, try things, get caught, and you know what I mean. Like, you can never prepare yourself for. Yeah. Obviously, we spar, but we spar in sixteen ounce and egg guards. Yeah, yeah. There's no. Have just, you been caught properly yet? Yeah, yeah. Have you? Yeah, yeah. I've had like a like a white flash, like boof. And is it you know I mean? sort of a few seconds, and then you're just back to normal, or is it drowsy? No, no. I think the white flash will make where it's boof, like you yeah. just. You've got to poker face it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You've literally got to poker face it. I, I think some people take it too far, they'll just like go, nah, yeah, and then yeah. the leg goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do go, no. Yeah, I know, I know, I know about you. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'd rather. But that's another thing, like, like doing stuff like that, if I get caught, I shake my head, like, like show, but it's like, yeah. it's just not me, it's just not in. It's not something I do, trash talk, it's just yeah. nothing I do. So it, w- when you were younger, did you look up to. Any boxers or rugby players or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lewis, like Lennox Lewis. For me, I was a big fan of Tommy Hearns. Okay. Um, but no, my obviously when I was young, my mother was doing it, so I looked up to a lot of players. That's another reason why I ended up going to Morgan as well. I love JJ Morgan. You know what I mean, yeah. Mo's one of the big. Like Jim Peacock, all over at Leeds, but he's a he's a great bloke. You know what I mean, good yeah, he is. Um, but that were Moswa, my like role model. Do you know what I mean? So I was lucky enough to end up obviously training with him and getting to know him. So, but and but boxing wise, I never really looked up to him. So I didn't have a chance to. Right. Okay. So what you do four rounds now? Uh, six. Six. So. I think, I think Right, yeah. and what? Who decides that? Uh, my coach and my manager. 
So is the people that always box eight rounds? So is it is it is the people who only box a certain amount of rounds, and you'll just look at moving up them? No, no, no. So I I could box someone that's four twelve rounds before. Right. Yeah, I could box someone that's that's their first eight rounder. Do you know what I mean? It differs, mate. And how do you feel after six rounds? Are you, do you feel like you could do more, or is that where your training will come in and get you prepared? Um, I don't, I don't know. Like training is different to fighting, obviously. Do you know what I mean? You feel different when you're fighting to when you're doing your training. Like when I spar, sometimes I get after six, I'm like, I, I'm on my ass. But sometimes after six, when we finish sparring, I'll be like, I could, I could have pushed up if I'd done more in during the sparring. Yeah. I've done a, an extra couple of rounds. On fight night, mate, like they say, like a bit of nervousness takes like something like, like 15 20 percent of your fitness out straight away, anyway. Um, right. Yeah, so I think on, on the night, <coughs> you can't really, you just got to go with it. I don't know. You just, you just got to walk. Like, I suppose, bit. though, if you knew you were going eight rounds, you, you'd, you'd pace you'd yourself more, time. wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. 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 I'll just keep knocking them out in first four. It'd help, it? Doesn't matter, does it? Eight, it 12, whatever it is, just, just make it four. See, you've got these coaches and all this tra- You just need me to tell you. Just keep knocking them out first. <laughs> you won't have to worry. Yeah, the Don't say before bed. But like, they ring me the night before a fight, and like the night of the fight, and it'll be like, it's I'm in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that, pal. <laughs> if he hits you back, just in. Like, don't don't worry about it. If he hits you, you're gonna get it. So, like, no, just hands up, just in. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, he's a proper dialum. Yeah, he is. He is a proper dialum. Um, how how did you get involved with Determined Dan? Um, so I ended up. I was working with Russ for a little bit. Right. Um. When I sat my chest, snap my chest, ended up being in an office. Do you know what I mean? My mate owned the business, and oh, well, I can't remember, but I got to know him. Do you know what I mean? Um, um, and Russ worked there. Um, Russ were in the same office. So I'm in office one arm. At this point, still had just things strapped up. Still arm. more useful than Russ. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so I just me and with Russ we we clicked to make. Do you know what I mean? We got on a lot. Um, and I, I don't really. I think it was obviously boxing that took me into getting um, in with determined Dan. Um, obviously, started doing well with boxing and that, and, and obviously Daniel were going through what we were going through, and I were good friends with Russ, and I, my brother-in-law third would be. And I always said to Russ, you know, I mean, if you ever need anything, let me know. Um, if there's anything I can help with, do whatever you like. So like, let me know. Um, and it just went from there, really, mate. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're getting involved, you wouldn't have been able to do any at work, would you? No, I mean, no, I was, I was training. Yeah, yeah, I was training and they did that. What, so, you mean to watch with me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I was training. Though. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I went to meet him one day in Wakefield and the idea was, because I've got a motorbike, I'll ride the bike so far and then walk back to him and then walk with him to the bike and just keep right, okay, yeah, keep yeah, doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but logistically it didn't work, thank God. Yeah. So I didn't end up doing any. I went to meet him in Hull at the end. Did you? Um, but yeah, they're on about doing canoeing. Are they, yeah? Canoeing from Liverpool to Leeds. You see, I do that. It saves your legs, I won't. Did you get that? Is uh... <laughs> But again, that's that's that motion. Yeah, do you yeah. think... But I would, genuinely would use that as a... An excuse to not do it. No, as a training. <laughs> as a training thing, I would use that as a, as a thing for training, to be fair. Yeah. Um, but... From the walk, mate, I am glad that, like, I did have training, to be fair. As, yeah. as good as a cause it was for, <laughs> I didn't want to walk. I'd have, for one, I'd have argued with Russ all the way around. Yeah. It'd have been tough on your voice. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah. And my back carrying him. So. <laughs> I don't know how much of it he did. I think he was at car with my dad most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Thought, From what I've heard. Looking after bags and that one. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was Officer of Doofus. <laughs> Officer <laughs> Doofus, we're body for duty, sir. <laughs> Yeah, well, I heard that. I heard look after yeah. So yeah, so I know that I know they've got some big plans. I I did a chat with Dan, and I said, "Do you ever do all like normal? Do you ever do all easy, or do you just think 
what's the hardest thing we can do? Let's times it by 10 and then we'll do that instead. Yeah, but is it ever, is it, is that what you're going to do as hard as what that kid's gone through? Yeah, this you know is I mean? it. Yeah. So. But to look at him and to talk to him, you you wouldn't know that it's even been that much of a struggle. Yeah. I found out a lot about it that I didn't know about. Um, I was in prison when I first found out. Yeah. Um, and it was tough because, like my sister was telling me on a visit, um, and I remember not really taking in what she was saying because they were doing some sort of raffle for Easter eggs in the visit. So I was like, oh, make sure you're doing this. And she was like, are you listening to what I'm telling you? I don't know if it was me trying not to hear. Um, but then I've gone back off the visit and I'm just sat thinking, oh, what an ignorant shit I am. She's trying to tell me this thing and I was talking about an Easter egg. And it was a while after that it started to sink in what had actually happened. Um, and then... I mean, they did a little walk around a couple of rugby clubs. Yeah. I got a tattoo of his scar on my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So who's the real supporter of Determined Dan? Do you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Any, I, everyone walks every day. Yeah, you know, everyone does a bit. Do you know? I, do you know what? Russell meant to come. I said to Russ, shall we both? Shall we get it? And he was like, oh, I'm not sure. I was like, honestly, I promise you it won't hurt. It'll be weird because you'll feel it vibrating, but you won't feel it on your head because it's bone. You, you've got no to worry about. Uh, so what he did is he just shaved the yeah, shape shaved into his head. Yeah. I was like, you big fanny. Time, yeah, he did, yeah. So um, I'm still trying. I'm, I'll get him to do it eventually. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. yeah. But to be fair, I got it done and I sent Dan a picture and I said, hi, mate, I, just w I want to show you this because I've got this tattoo to show you that having that scar on your head should never hold you back in your life. Yeah. It should never stop you from doing anything you ever want to do. And I sent him this really nice message. And then he's just like, cheers, mate. And we've never, <laughs> we've never had a picture together. He's never asked to see it. <laughs> so part of me is just like, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm sure he did. He just didn't have a clue how to. Yeah. Yeah, he is. But it's just amazing the stuff that he's still doing. Like he still goes to play basketball. He still wants to be an architect. You know, he's taught himself to write and draw with his left hand. And while we're saying, oh yeah, I did my knee and I had to do these things and this recovery and, you know, you hurt your chest. And even though it's a really, really bad thing. His, I spoke to a girl who had brain surgery, first ever operation, age 20. So she had to shave all her hair off. And she said that was one of the worst things for her as a, like a beautiful young female having to shave her hair off yeah. so the first operation she's ever had she has to sign a form to say i understand that i might die and then she lays on a trolley gets put to sleep not what knowing whether she's going to wake up again this yeah. is it so it's crazy to think and you know I, I, as much as people go through i feel like we're really lucky you know you're 25 both your eyes point in the same direction. You don't have a, a speech impediment. You don't have anything that makes you stand out where, as a child, people could pick on you. You know, when, you know when you're young and you don't think about stuff and you just target people for little, little things that stand out. Um, and this is one of the things I say to the young people. You're in such a, a privileged position to be able to do anything you want to do in your life. And instead you want to smash bus stop windows and, you know, shout at old people. And it's like, what, what are you doing with your life? And you just want to you want you want to fast forward them a couple of years to show them where the what's, where what's the yeah this yeah. is it and so yeah it is it's it's really tough so what's next then who's the next fighter when's the next fight do you know I'll tell you mate with all this going on um, I know my, my manager like pencils stuff in yeah um, throughout the year you know he does it at the beginning of the year he says I'll we'll, we'll have a show in March April June November right. December. It's quite a lot for professionals, isn't it? What, yeah, four or five a year? It's got a lot of fighters. Yeah. So, like, the February, March, or the March, April, I'll only fight on one of them. Oh, right, right. okay. Do you know what I mean? Because he's got that many lads, he likes to yeah. get them all out at around the same time. Um, but he said he's got November pencils in that he did earlier on in the year. He said he's going to leave it in there. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If he was offered a fight behind closed doors, no fans, would you do it? Yeah, yeah. Would you? Yeah. I bet that would be eerie unless they did what they're doing at football and just played crowd noise no, <laughs> that could yeah, make it different I know, I know but at the same time mate, look how many I know it's only sparring but sparring is there's only four of you in a room including you and your opponent yeah I suppose you know I mean? yeah. so it's not that much different and especially yeah. if your goal if you don't run off 
fans, you know, are getting you on. Then you know, it's really sweet, won't you? you know what I mean, but if if crowd is what actually makes you the fighter you are, then yeah, you're at a disadvantage, aren't you? Yeah, they um they did a UFC um fight in America behind closed doors, right. and the way they talked about it, it was sort of it was good for the few people that was in there that was able to watch it but it's different without the atmosphere. Yeah, 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 of course. And you can imagine it being the same. Like if you're if you're if you've got a, a room full of fans and you do get that little oh shit what just happened there. Mm-hmm. That sort of shouting I, I guess would sort of help you come round and yeah. but saying that if you don't really hear people no. it won't make a difference to you, would no. it? No. It's like literally isn't it? Like you get slightly like hearing but one of my mates is fighting on the uh, on the UFC island. Oh really? Yeah, yeah, Matt Diacati, yeah. Yeah, he's in camp up there, he's going to fight in, in the island, mate, yeah. And where is he is he local as well, is he Leeds? Yeah, he lives in Leeds, yeah, he's originally from Doncaster. Lived in America for two and a half years. Uh, but he trains with us, you know what I mean? We've got the same strength and condition, the same boxing coach. Right. Um, is Steve Wayne still doing it? Yeah. I'm sure I went to watch him fight at Frontier. Many, many years ago. Yeah. Did you, yeah? Pretty sure it was Steve, because Steve Wayne and uh, Ben Brummett, they were both. Ben Brummett came out of Army, um, and I'm sure he went. He was definitely down at Golden Team. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure them them two have had fights at Frontier before. I think, yeah. I don't think I've. I think I've seen, yeah, I've been there. Uh, Steve's fight before, actually. I think I watched him at, um, down at Chan Charles Centre. Right. Bit. Yeah, because they do the. The ring walk, the rubbing the rope, the pre- oh, yeah. I, that's what I wanted to ask you. You, when you turn before a fight, is is it? Do you? Is there like a prayer in your head that you say, or is it just sort of like a a moment where you? Nice. No, um, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I do say a little something to myself, but yeah, yeah, I just put my head in my gloves and I, I push. I don't know why, I push the dab right. like, into my eyes. Like oh, like just above my eyes, like my eyebrows are. I push yeah. dead hard and say something to myself, and then. Okay, oh. is it the same thing every time? Yeah, yeah. Is it all right? I want to guess. I want to. I say no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think everyone will have that. Though. Do you have any like certain routine or certain thing you go through? When no, you I I got some advice on. If. If I allow myself to, I'll spend the whole time. So usually I'm last on. So usually I'll sort of like headline a, la- a night. So I'll be one of the last to perform. If I allow myself to, I'll spend the whole night while other people are performing, not listening to them, running through the words in my head. But the problem with that is if you're running through the words and someone comes to talk to you and say something and they cut you off, you've lost momentum. So it, it for me, it's like a, I bet I forget my words when I get to that bit. So what I do now is either on the way there or when I get there, I'll take sort of 20 minutes off, however however long the thing is. So if it's 20 minutes, I don't do it at, at pace that I usually would. I'll just go through them as quick as I can. So oh, I'll, yeah. as long, I'll just get the words out as fast as I can yeah. um, in my head. As many times over? Just once. Oh, right. So I'll just run through my set, right. uh, one after the other, bump, 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 done. I know it's in my head. I'm just going to go and enjoy my night and then I don't think about it anymore. Right, okay. Whereas otherwise I'll be sat and it'll just be... It'll be. I'll be constantly thinking because I I nearly quit. So when I first started, I'd memorise the words, but then I'd get up and the way my head works, it works at 100 mile an hour, and I can't read a book because I can't focus on this one thing. It's always all over the place. So what used to happen is I'd get the words in my head. So I'd be at home and I'd be like, yeah, no problem. I'd get up on stage and then while I'm stood up, my head would be saying, oh, don't forget to look over there. You need to look. Right, and yeah, instead yeah. of my head telling me what the words are going to be, it's telling me where I need to be looking and that bit's coming up where you do that thing with your hand. Or, yeah. And it, I had this internal monologue, this commentary, um, and I just used to forget my words regularly. So what I do now is when, when I'm trying to memorise something, I put um, rap music on where I know the words. So my head's singing along to the words, but my mouth just automatically says whatever piece I'm trying to memorise. Yeah, well, it does, my head does, but because my mouth is now doing what it needs to do without me thinking about it, my head can enjoy the music, my mouth goes into autopilot, so all I need to know is the first line, and then my mouth just does it, just does it. So as long as I can do it before that, that day before, I know it's in my head, 
and then I'll get up and do it. It's, it's madness. I'll get to do that. I'll get <laughs> yes, I've found something that you can't do. Well, I'll be singing, people are like, what's he doing? I'll be singing. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's the only way I can do it. Um, but now I ain't I ain't done it for months, and then I've been I meant to be going on a tour, like how rock and roll does that sound? Poetry tour. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be like hotel rooms, girls smashing TVs. I don't think it's gonna be any of that. But um, but yeah, we've been given some money. We're gonna go to a couple of recovery places. So we'll go, for example, we've got Middlesbrough to a recovery centre, run a workshop. Um, through the day and then do a performance on the night stay over and then move on to the nice. to the next one yeah proper rock and roll yeah I am I'm looking forward to it but the nerves have kicked in because I haven't done it for so long and now because it's not just doing it for fun it's not just yeah, you know fun. yeah this yeah. is it I'm getting paid for this um, so you've got to be on point it's got to be yeah no thanks pressure. for that mate yeah Sorry, cheers Sorry. cheers pal <laughs> you've got to do it now yeah like before like you say Got it wrong, you got it wrong. It's on you, it's on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. It's pressure, doesn't it? Yeah, cheers. Right. And we're going to be running workshops, talking to people about confidence and all the rest of it. And then I'm going to get up and fluff Shout my words. <laughs> I did it for you guys to show you that you can still make mistakes and it's still I'll all tell right. You who I do watch who was a, a good speaker. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, Trent Shelton. I haven't. Have you not? No. So, what does he talk about? It's more like motivation type type speaker, mate. But because I watch a lot of, um, I watch a lot of Will Smith. Um, he was talking to me about McGregor, but I don't watch him a lot. Uh, but Trent Shelton, um, he tends to watch him. I'm just gonna send that to myself. Trent Shelton. Yeah, mate, yeah, he's he's very good. So I watched I watched something with um, Will Smith talking about fear. Have you seen it? Yeah. And he's saying that when I'm laid in my bed the day before, I'm in absolute fear and I'm in the safest place I could ever be in. But my head's allowing me to fill myself full of this fear. And then when he jumped, it was just it was just calm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's crazy to think, yeah. isn't it? I say that a lot of say the best things in life are on the other side of fear. Yeah. And on the other side of your comfort yeah. zone. Yeah. This is it. Like when I went snowboarding, so I, I ride motorbikes and um I don't have to say this without my mum getting me into trouble. So let's say if I was on a private bit of land and I was going fast where it's allowed, like on a track or something like that, (laughs) like a track there. So the the feeling of speed on a bike. So I'm on this snowboard and I'm going down this mountain and I'm going too fast and I'm not in control. And all I'm thinking is I'm really going to hurt myself. This is after I'd already broke my shoulder. Not knowing, I didn't know I'd broke my shoulder. I just know I'd hurt my shoulder. I'd cracked my ribs, and I'm just going down this mountain and thinking, you know what, snowboarding is probably not for me. This thing, <laughs> this thing, going to end well. And I was, I was absolutely shitting myself. And then I managed to sort of carve the board in a way that I got back under control. Oh, okay. And that feeling afterwards, I was like, I want to go again. That rush, yeah, I yeah, want to yeah, go yeah. again, and that's that's the nearest comparison I've ever had to the feeling of sort of doing 150 on a bike, right. you know, that sort of, that adrenaline, that feeling. Um, and it's, it's hard to get that, that experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even, I think even if you were to jump out of a plane, there's still an element of safety there. You've strapped to somebody, they've done it thousands of times before, you know what they're doing. Um, but I've not done it to know whether that's a similar I feeling. Like to, I would like to do that though. Determined, Dan. Let's do it. I would like to do something. Would you be allowed to do it? Yeah. Is there restrictions on what you can do in your spare time? Um, or is it down time. to you? Uh, oh, yeah, so spare time's for normal people who have different jobs who get, like, <laughs> no, time I mean, off. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, like, obviously, when I'm not in camp. Yeah. Like, when I'm just doing my own. Yeah, out of those 10 weeks. No, no, I can do whatever I want, really. Right. Mm. But I suppose it's down to you knowing if yeah. you do something daft. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, have you ever been into motorbikes or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Motorbikes, yeah. yeah. One of them made races. Oh, does it? Yeah, yeah, races on track, yeah. Right. Yeah, races, buggies and bikes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Got a road quad, I go out on that road quad and stuff like that. Yeah. Up to 700 hours. I went to North Yorkshire on one of those and Beats trying to, uh, just trying to, well, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a 700. And on, on my bike, when I want to turn, I go like this. Yeah. On a quad, it's like I turned and I tried and it just kept going straight and you've got to like you've got to almost 
broadslide into corners. Yeah, I was like, well, I can't get used to this. Yeah, it's not worse when you come close to a, a thing either. Uh, so me and him were both out on the cross, and I'm behind him. He's riding in front, and uh, he's very good on bikes and cross yeah. and what have you. But at some point, I don't know why he did it. I think we might have drove past somewhere, and he's looked at me, and he's in front of me, and he's, he's turned around to look at me, and not seeing that the car in front is turning. And obviously with quads and that you got to do your momentum and stuff. But yeah. uh, I don't know if you've ever come up when you if you ever come up close call on quad, but it's so easy to flip. <laughs> and he's looked at me, laughed at something. But we drove past him and he turned around, and started laughing, and he's looked forward and like it's like a hero away from car, and he's had to like literally throw, you know, like the quads at side. Like obviously we've yeah. like, but he like come up on two wheels and he's very good on them, so it, it was it was sound, but. So he's nearly crashed, but he went up on two wheels and missed the car. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like I bet he was he's, he's buzzing with that. He's thrown the quad over, and it's like tipped. Do you know what I mean? He didn't mean yeah, yeah, yeah. to tip, but it did. But, um, yeah, no. Nah, you, you bet you didn't have a GoPro up front oh. of yours. You didn't have a camera up front of yours. No, no, oh, that would have been a good it video. It would have been good. <laughs> it was, it was just on Bar Road, was that? Was it? It was just on Bar Road, yeah, but they are good fun then, mate. Yeah. I love quads. Yeah, I don't... I mean, you can only have one on a car license, though, can't yeah, you? Yeah, unfortunately. So, yeah. yeah. Which well, is saying that, it's better for, better for me, personally, because I don't have a bike license. Yeah. But before, you could use a car, no claims bonus, on the quad. Oh, you know right. I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's just a, it's a car insurance. Yeah. Because you have to wear helmets on them, either. No, nothing. Um, and that's what I did. I choose to go out on my shorts and t shirt on them. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, when it's a nice day, obviously, I'd go out. But now, the world that you use, you know, claims bonus, so insurance on Right. Yeah. Like yeah I, like two grand I've I've been riding bikes probably over twenty years now, right. and I've had three accidents. All one was two thousand and sixteen, where a car came through a giveaway, and we sort of I managed to slam back brake on and turn, so I didn't go straight into him. So we just sort of bang sides, and then someone went in back of me in not far from here in Holbeck, right. rode that bike off. That was on a Monday on my side. I think the handlebars went into me. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was really, really bad. <laughs> Magic sponge, <laughs> and I was up and about. But then three days later, I got a hire bike dropped off, and a 16-year-old kid in a stolen car cut in front of me as I'm coming up from White Rose past where you turn into Gardinals towards Tommy Watts. So I've swerved, hit a curb, and I had full kit on. And as I'm sliding, I slid for quite a distance, sliding up the road. I broke bones in my hand. And the jacket I had on, the sleeve rolled up, and I took all the skin off my arm. Really? And they, they like they go on about wearing proper gear. And it was yeah, a brand yeah. new Alpine Star jacket. I'd, I'd bought it because I had the crash on the Monday, oh, so it was three. It was less than three days old, yeah. and yeah, the sleeves just came up. So when people talk about, yeah, oh, you shouldn't go out on bikes in tracksuit yeah, bottoms yeah, or yeah. normal jeans on, it's like, well, I spent money on proper kit, yeah. and it still, it's still it did nothing for me. Yeah, but is that the thing as well though with bikes and more, more bikes and quads and stuff? Not you, is it? Yeah. Like you don't need to watch how you are driving. This is it. Other people. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm I'm quite... When I'm on the motorway, if I'm riding, I know I'm going to be in a blind spot of the car that I'm overtaking. Yeah. So what I do is I look in his mirror because if I see him glancing in his mirror, there's a yeah. chance he hasn't seen me and he's going to pull across. Yeah. So I'm I'm very aware when I'm on it. But like I say, the one in the one in Holbeck, I was sat in traffic and it just went into the back of me. So now what I do is I leave a massive gap and I point towards the middle. So if oh, I can yeah. see something coming up quick, I'll just... Yeah, I've got yeah. time to get away, yeah. and then with them, like I say, it just it pulled in front. And what I found out that they do is, they, they pull in front of you so you stop. Then they use the car to push the bike over at slow speed, and then they get out and steal the bike. They did it a week later in Armley. Oh really? Yeah. So me swerving, I hit curb at forty, and it just threw me. A bike was mashed. It was a yeah. brand new MT10. It, they're worth about twelve, thirteen grand, yeah, yeah. but zero miles. I know. I was devastated. And that's the bike I wanted, and then I thought, there's, there's summit here. I'm not, yeah, I'm not gonna bikes. do it. So I'd yeah, love a, I'd love like a, a touring bike. Me. Yeah, I'd be KTM, like a nice big touring bike. Yeah, yeah. Me drive to Spain and stuff like that. We were talking about doing it. Me, um, auntie and uncle's got a place in Bulgaria. Right. Um, so me and we broke up this year, but me and the girlfriend, she, um, she's into bikes. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, we're kind of. Oh, the girl who you live, you don't live with her. No, no. Oh mate, sorry. No, no, it's alright. <laughs> we're good though. We're good. We're all right, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so she, um, we, we were gonna do the same. Um, just get like a Torah, 
drive to Bulgaria, just sort of stop in London, France, and you know, just yeah. book a hotel for every day until we get there, spend a week there, and then do the same back. Yeah. But do, do, do you super bike or you open bag or super um, Open bag, so it's a Triumph speed triple, oh, see, yeah. um, bright orange. Yeah, I'll a bit of a. I won't be a superbike man, I'd be a... It's too, especially when you're taller and it's yeah, it's and it's uncomfortable. Like, yeah, yeah, I yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I, I was looking at the, at the KTM, they do a 1290, and I was just like, oh, no, I, it, won't, it won't be any good. Like, the Bandit were bad enough. The, the, the Triumph's quicker than the Bandit, but not top end. Right. So it'll get to sort of 60 um, <laughs> quicker than what the Bandit would have done. Um, but then after that, it tops out about 130-ish. So, but I do. I love them. I've never it, cars have never interested me. Yeah, they're not. No. Yeah, I've seen I've seen Airdresser's car you've got outside. Yeah. But I'm not into all that like like Toyota Supra and Pacific stuff. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. Right. Like, so you just I want to buy a car as it is. I just appreciate, appreciate it, it nice for what car. it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you if you get another big check and you're going to upgrade your car, what would you get? I'll be check. <laughs> okay, we'll go fifty grand to start with. Fifty grand. Uh, Someone's listening. In my uh, Google the just. Is approximately three point four six 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 seven. I won't get one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how much Not of a. Uh... It got to sixty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a clue what just happened uh, then. See, I'm the type of person like my dream car. My dream car would be like a Phantom or a Rolls Royce. Okay. It wouldn't be a Ferrari or a Lamborghini yeah, yeah. or that. Um, if I went to fifty grand budget, man, um, I don't know. I'd, I'd like a. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's the type of man I am. I'm more of a Rolls Royce than a Ferrari. Right, okay. Yeah. See, I've always been in love with Porsches. I think if you pay 120 grand for a Porsche, 120 grand for a Ferrari, you get the same top speed, you get the same performance, but the Porsche, you're getting suede interior, you're getting leather interior, you're getting heated seats, you're getting all the luxuries, but you still get the performance, whereas Ferrari, it's got door hand, you know, windy yeah. windows and yeah. stuff yeah. like that. Mine, it's an Hawks lead. Yeah. <laughs> <Ferrari, right? laughs> um, well, the sponsor um, is a good friend, um, Darren Lung at Quamba. He's got um, he's got a four five eight, and he's got the GT three RS. Oh wow! And the GT three RS pisses over Ferrari. Yeah, honestly, like I agree with. You. See, even the GT three RS, that's the stripped down version, but you still probably get more in the cockpit of that than you do in most of the Ferraris. See, he's got everything, like, he's just, like, top spec, do you know what I mean? has got roll cage in it, everything. Do you know what oh, I mean? wow. It's, it's honestly made for badass. If you like Porsches, you'd like So, that. you're going to introduce and get a day out, and is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sort it out. But yeah, mate, he's, he's got a, a white one, a white one, right. GT3 hours. And it's w- is it written down side at door? Yeah, yeah. What colour is that? Do you remember? I have a black, you know. It's yeah. a black, black one. Mate, it's honestly, it's yeah. I love them. I absolutely love them. What about your tattoos? Where do you get them done? Um, a mate of mine does them. Um, it's called Shuey. Oh, I know Shuey. Yeah, yeah, Shuey and Beeson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Them, so we grew up not far apart. Um, he lived not far from where I am now. Oh, right. um, Brother Khaled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're, they're a couple of years older, so they're more my sister's, uh, middle sister, so there's Alicia and Tony. Yeah, I, think I think they're more Alicia's age. I think, um, I think she was about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think he's like mid-30s. Is he still up Middleton? He, he had a shop at where... No, he's in Beeston now. Oh, is he? No, as the opposite, as in Beeston. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, just down the street there. Um, can't remember the name of the road, like, but... Yeah, he's in there, but... I, I, he does all the time, like... Has he done all of them, has he? Yeah, yeah, barring one. Just, he had done the sleeve. He's done sleeve, neck, leg. Yeah. And with your neck? <laughs> did you, uh <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what did your mum say about your tattoos? She loves them. Does she? Mm-hmm. I got it's told not to get them on my hand or my neck. So, yeah. But when they put the stencil on, they put the stencil on my arm and I was just like, oh, I'll tell you what, just start at that end and work your way back and then I can't change yeah. my mind. And with this, I'm just pushing my look a little bit. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's just I'm gonna get the same on the other side and then maybe just do a couple here. Best thing I've ever done. This is my like for me it's the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah, I love my neck. Uh, but now my mum wasn't me, Nana. Nana, she's like Does she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She goes, you'll regret it when you're older. She says, I might not get older. <laughs> <laughs> I might be a young lover, I might not get old. Yeah. And she can't tell us say stuff like that, that we stop at your titles, but we're just addicted to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, like, someone that's addicted to like trainers, say you get a pair of trainers, you want a new pair. Yeah, yeah. That's just come out. Like, yeah. See someone with a title. Yeah, I want that place to it. So have you got plans for your next ones? I've got, this is getting finished, I'm going down to my knuckles again. Right. So, same, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Both arms, chest, leg, back. Do you think it's intimidating when you go into a fight when you're covered? Um, no, I think it's maybe back in day it might be, but now it's, it's, it's more bit, normal to see. Yeah, it's more normal to see. Yeah, but I think I think it, like especially me personally with neck and stuff like. Did you use numbing cream? There, I did. Mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've been. T- I don't know anyone that's ever had the neck done without it. I had I had a bit of my chest done and he did this thing called stippling. I don't know if can you is it far down enough? Yeah, but it's instead of instead of so all this is dot work. So instead of it being dot 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 dot, what they do is they make the needle longer. And if you imagine a kid with a Crayola, yeah, so they just go like this, and then they wipe it away, and they'll probably be like twelve dots. So they go over it about six or seven times. And I was laid. I was just like, mate, I'm gonna have to tap out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to say I can't do it because it was just the same spot, just literally scribbling over like four or five times. So I had to use numbing cream to get my chest finished. Oh, yeah. The, you know the, the going over. Yeah. You know what gets me most the tissue. You know when the. I think they enjoy oh. that because they do do it and like there's no need to put that much no, pressure. I say that is that you, <laughs> you don't need to. It. It's like sandpaper. Get some good paper. <laughs> <laughs> I've paid you enough chest. money. <laughs> what are you using yeah. this paper yeah. for? <laughs> Literally, it's a quid for like six days. I'm no wonder it's like some paper. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with that. That is the worst bit. Horrible, I don't man. know if it's because you're already sore from the tattoo or what have you, but yeah. it is. They do, and they, yeah. they spray the thing on, and they're like, they want to get a good video, and they do that whole drag. Yeah. Well, I did I an interview it's with him. Cut my face out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I did an interview with him and he was saying um, I've become a pussy he said when you get to know your tattooist you become more of a pussy I was like what do you mean He's like well you complain about paying more now than when you first started and I think when you don't know someone yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. want to say oh that's painful yeah. but I've also heard that if you're right handed the right side of your body hurts less oh ok so with, you're left handed yeah. So which side was worse for you? Do you know? Can you remember? Did you? Yeah, apparently the whatever hand you are, that's that side can take more pain. So I started with this side. That's it's probably bullshit. It's just my way of saying no. <laughs> science. It's science. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but worst pain for me at times, I think my chest was bad. Yeah. I've got my full leg done it goes right up into my groin and I've got uh, Anubis in my groin because mm. I've got Egyptian feet and uh, I was like I needed to take right in the crease right in the crease yeah because the closer this got to my armpit yeah. was sore and then just little bits like in between in between here yeah, yeah they're, they're not nice then, yeah. like, but like I had to I had to like, like literally pull myself to the side because it's that far up into my groin right, right. Back and right yeah yeah it's, it's ears as well, so they'll go right into a point and it's a thin needle. Oh, I'm like, listen, shoot it. I'm going home. Like, like, if you go home, you get your shower and your stencil comes off. Like, it's, it's, gonna, you know what I mean? it's not going to be sh- it's not gonna be how yeah, it should yeah. be now. You might just, just stay with me. But then I'm sure he just does stuff purposely. It's a little bit deeper or a little bit slower on line, I don't know, but it's. It's probably to say I can make a professional boxer cry. Yeah, yeah. That's I all know. it is. I've got my ass killing his groin. I can't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's there, does it? Yeah. Even even things like 
when when I'm getting mine done and he turns my arm over and then he sticks the bit that's been done to the yeah. stool and you're oh, like, holds that yeah, turn your hand over. <laughs> yeah, on, definitely. <laughs> but that's the thing; they can't feel it, so they no, don't no, care, no, do no, they? I, I do full days with him. I don't like doing yeah. like half a day or a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. I do full days with him, and there's nothing worse when I don't, obviously you're, you're probably doing a full day. But say we're doing this here, he'll do this and he'll go onto here a few hours, come back onto here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But even start. even without a couple of hours, so this one, when he when he did this, he did that bit, yeah. and then that bit, and then that bit, and he went round like that. So now this bit saw. And then he did that bit, that <laughs> bit, that bit, went round. So now this yeah, bit saw, and then he did that and that. Yeah, yeah. And he just kept going round clockwise. And you just think, why didn't you start that end and work yeah, your way yeah. down? I say that. Finish that. <laughs> Finish that, then do this. <laughs> just, don't, just don't be going back and forth. Not worse. So, Shuey, if you're listening. You're Oh, brilliant. Mate, listen, I really appreciate you coming on. It's been really good to get to know you. We've never really spoke much oh, before no. this, but I definitely want to sort of see you getting involved in some of the work we do with the young yeah, people, and yeah. um, it'd be good to have you in that. And Anything whenever whenever your next fight is, good luck for that. Appreciate it. All right, mate. No worries.